Hi, welcome to Hots and Hacks. Today we're going to take you through part two of our machine learning classification model building with R from scratch. This is going to be using tidy models under the workflow preprocess train validate tidy models methodology. Okay, let me just launch R and let's get straight into this. So in the previous step, apologies, I'm going to go a bit further up. We're going to resume where we left off from the first markdown document. So previously we saved our image. Now we're going to load our image back in. So load file data stranded data RDA. You can see that all that's been now loaded into our um, environment window. So what we're going to do, and these are strategies now for improving machine learning models uh, in terms of the representation in the data and in terms of model choice and in terms of something called hyperparameters so tuning those so in a test train data set split we reserve a partition for test and a partition for training data predominantly uh, the largest part is reserved for training data typical values used there are about 70 75 80 percent in essence, you want more of the data in the training to pick up on the patterns retrospectively in your data. So to highlight the difference between features, the correlations, the interactions, etc. Next thing to do in terms of that will, might give you a slightly biased sample. So what we really want to do now is assess how well our model will perform in the wild, i.e. how well it will perform with production data that's unseen that the model doesn't know about. So in terms of testing that out, we use a process called k-fold cross-validation. So cross-validation essentially divides the data sets up by iterations, so e, each iteration, one, two, three, e10. What we then what we end up doing is taking a training fold and a testing fold, then iteration two, we'll take a different training fold and a different testing fold, iteration three, take a different training fold and a different testing fold. Essentially, what we want to do is train and test it on different data sets in each iteration. So each different training sets and different testing folds. This allows the model to build a better representation of the underlying data in the training sets by using different partitions. Also, it allows us to test it on different uh, sets as well. This is the kind of industry standard for machine learning. And again, different fold values are normally recommended. 5 and 10 fold cross validation is, is normally utilized, depends on the task at hand. For this example, we're going to use 10 fold. Research suggests that actually any more folds than that, your representation and improvements potentially that can be gleaned in accuracy diminish. So, to actually implement this in our model, we're going to run this line and we use the v fold cv. Um, out of our, our parsing package. We use the training data and we're going to set the number of Vs, although it should be K if it's linking back to the mathematical equation. Um, 10. Statistical equation, sorry. Um, we're going to use our previous workflow that we've already created. So refer to the first tutorial if you've not um, been following along from the first part. I suggest you do that, that bit first and then come back to this. We're going to use our stranded workflow that we've, we've previously created and we're going to use the fit underscore resamples command to fit this resample. So these resamples here in this equation in this model to improve representation. So this fit resamples is done in a second. It might take a second or two to, to uh, terminate. And that's now finished. So now what we've got to do is because we've done different resamples, We've got to then find a way to aggregate them. So we've got to use the collect metrics function, which will essentially create a mean score of all of those resampled metrics in terms of accuracy and area under the curve. So you can see that the, the first print of the collected metrics has brought this back as the data frame will give you the number of um, samples, number of observations. The mean accuracy uh, in terms of the prediction accuracy in that data set in all the data sets and the, the area under the curve with the reported standard errors as well. 
Then I've just printed this out so it's a bit more user friendly. So I'm just saying that the true accuracy of the model is more like with those 10, 10 different samples, 75% accurate as opposed to our simple training and test split, which showed 78.74, so about 79%. So we've lost accuracy, but we've actually increased representation in the test data. So that's an important concept. The next concept and the next, next way to improve our model would be to define a different model. So we're going to use the popular random forest. So essentially random forests are constructed. There are lots of decision trees which make predictions. Then the random forest chooses those predictions. So it gets all those trees to vote. The majority vote normally wins in random forests and then the predictions are made so from, from those, those uh, majority votes. So it was a voting scheme. Think about our local elections or, you know, presidential elections if you're in America or in other in other countries. You essentially vote for your preferred candidate and that's essentially how ensemble methods work. So we're going to fit our model. So we've instantiated this model. We're not we've not fit it yet. Next stage is to fit our model to the previous training data. So we've already got the training data defined from the load. So we're going to fit this and we can see this has been fitted. Um, I'm getting a docker warning that must be for something else that I was playing with earlier. So the next thing to do, so we've, we've, we've essentially created a better model. So a better model that's going to give us a better accuracy. Uh, we're now going to then put our resamples through that model. So we're going to create this random forest workflow. We're going to use the workflow command. We're going to add a model to that workflow. So we want to attach the model, our random forest model. We're going to add the formula on top of that through piping. So we're going to use the stranded class. And we're going to use all the other variables in that class. We're going to set a seed value. So this is just nothing more than a random seed. So when this selects the folds at random, it will select the same folds for my as mine in the demonstration. So you'll get the same results. Otherwise, if you didn't include this, you'd get essentially different results every run because they take different resamples because it's um, sampling with replacement. So it just keeps sampling different different sets. So we're going to set the seed. We're going to use our random forest workflow. We're going to fit resamples. That's the important uh, one if you're doing more than one sample. So if it was just a train test split and you were fitting on the test data, you get rid of the underscore resamples. You just have fit here because we've got 10, essentially 10 resamples. We need to fit it on that and we're going to print print out those resamples as well. So model take perhaps a minute or two to fit. Ah, a bit quicker than I thought. 10 core cross validation resampling results is done. And these are what the splits look like. So actually you could go run a forest fit rs and i bet you could use list notation to look at the splits and then keep going so actually just look at the splits themselves shows you how the splits look and you can access each one of the list elements that way again that doesn't mean really mean much so we're just going to print again the the resample there. The next thing to do is to collect all our resample metrics, so to create those averages. And here we've improved our accuracy by using a different model and using that resampling approach. It's about 79% accurate now. And the other the curves also improved, which is what we'd expect. So the next step, what you could also do is use hyperparameter tuning. So we're going to use that on the old decision tree to show how we can perhaps improve that old decision tree's accuracy. So in terms of the tree, we're going to use the decision tree from the pulse snip package. And here we're going to set up two of the tuning parameters that we want to look at. So our cost complexity. So just to talk to you about the cost complexity a second, I'll just bring this up on my desktop so you can see. So, let 
So cost complexity essentially uh, tunes the error, so it prunes the tree. So it's the RT is the error of the decision tree uh, rooted at node T, so our T node. So it looks at how far down to prune the tree. CT is the number of leaf nodes from the node T. So essentially, how far down the tree should we prune in terms of the number of leaf nodes that we're going down? And the parameter alpha specifies the relative weight between the accuracy and the complexity of the tree. So that's a way to optimize how accurate versus how complex to go. So with, with, with this type of parameter tuning, this com cost complexity parameter, it's the trade-off between accuracy over complexity. So accuracy, you'd want to optimize, but if it gets too complex, it could take a long time to train. So essentially that's the, the um, formula for cost complexity. Relatively simple, it's the uh, RT is the error of the decision tree plus A times CT. So the, the actual weight plus the weight times the, the uh, complexity, so the number of leaves or nodes from the tree. Okay, back to R then. So that sets that one up and then tree depth just how far to grow the tree out. So I'm going to set this up. And again, you can look at help to see what each one of the parameters is from the dials package. The next thing to do is we've got all these um, parameters now. So let me get rid of that because I can show you what it's actually done. So essentially it creates a tuning grid for you this way. Sorry, no, that, that creates the model, the tune tree. We're going to create a grid now to, to, to tune our hard parameters by. So through iteration, it will go through each, each part of the grid and then do it stepwise. So it'll start complexity this, so one times exponential to the power of 10, which is a really low number. It's something like 0 0.00001. And then tree depth. And then it will keep iterating the tree depth down all the way to whatever number we specified, 20. We said go down by 20 combinations. So it'll be 20 combinations of all these in blocks in sequence. So you can see it's doing that. This will take a while, so what we need to do now is use the parallel package. So we're going to use the parallel detect calls function. And I'm going to use all but one call. So if I run these lines separately, you can see that I've got three CPU calls available. I'm going to make a cluster on my memory, and then I'm going to register this cluster. So I'm going to run all those lines. And that's then essentially set up par parallel processing for the training of the model. OK. I previously trained this model. This takes about uh, 30 minutes to train because using resamples on each one of the decision trees. So I'm going to go to the next step, which is actually the, the visualizing the tuning process. But essentially, what we're doing here is the same steps that we repeated earlier. Create a workflow, add in a model, add in the formula that we want to predict, creating a uh, an object. Uh, that's going to fit this. So our workflow that we've created here, use our tune tune grid, so grid search, based on our resamples, so each one of those resamples, and that grid tree that we looked at earlier. So it's doing resampling and doing hyperparameter tuning at the same time. If I visualize the tuning process, we'll see a plot in a second. So you can actually see for each one of the cost complexity and depth, the optimal accuracies that we're looking at here. So actually, this this could be quite difficult to understand if you've never interpreted one of these plots before. I know what it is because uh, I can read that plot. Another package that you can use is use the tune function to show the best area under the curve or select the best area under the curve. So actually it's reporting out that the best, they're the best options for area under the curve. And it's selected the best parameter as cost complexity this and tree depth that. So go down four nodes um, and that's our length, that's where we should be pruning it at essentially. And it does that through optimization. So looking at the best area under the curve. You can also change this to accuracy if you wanted to select the best accuracy. It's the same same process. So if I run that again, 
it's going to select the best accuracy. So now it's changed slightly. It showed that actually it's not necessarily the best under the curve anymore. The tree depth's one. But actually I want to optimize the, the uh, sensitivity versus the specificity. So predicting stranded because we had an unbalanced data set. So it makes more sense to stick an area under the curve. Okay. So now I'm going to use my best tree to make some predictions on it. So I'm going to use the tree workflow and I'm going to finalize my workflow by selecting the best tree. And you can see the best tree has now been passed through to the main arguments. So you've got the cost complexity and you've got the tree depth. And it's the R part computational engine that it's using. Finally, we're going to predict on our validation data. So we're going to use the data, the train data, sorry, the final workflow. This is our final tree that we want to utilize. It's been optimized with those hyperparameter tuning functions. Here with the R part package, it shows you the, the ID optimum splits. So age 34.5. Um, and, and the, those different splits there. You could use another package to visualize those splits. Uh, in uh, the RPOT package, there is actually a, a plot for that. So the next thing to do, we're going to use the final tree prediction. We're going to pull our workflow fit. And we're going to use the, the variable importance plot to see which variables are the most, most important at predicting whether a patient's stranded. So this makes sense. I'd expect age and uh, previous care in the last 12 months to be the two biggest factors. So next step is to uh, create the final predictions. So here, what it's going to do is it's going to use the final workflow and it's going to use the last fit on our split that we created here. It's going to use the final fit and it's going to collect the metrics and it's going to print our final fitted metrics. And then what we're going to do is we're going to collect predictions of final fit. So you can see here of our training test split, we've got those that are predicted not stranded, those that are predicted stranded, which row they're linked to and the predicted class and their actual class. So we've got a bit of a misclassification here. We'd expect that. Visualize the final fit on a rock curve. This is the same as we dealt with in the previous example. We're going to create a rock curve just to see how well it's fitting. And again, it's, it's starting to hover around about, like we said, about 78 odd percent before it's, uh, it kind of concaves off. So that's essentially how you then create those predictions. We create those predictions and you combine those onto the original holdout data that we utilized earlier. So the testing data just by using R bind or row bind. So last part of it is to inspect the parsnip object. So if you want to dis if you want to inspect any of the models and understand which parameters can be tuned, you can just pass them in by the args function. So I know that the random forest, you can tune the number of uh, random nodes to split on the number of trees. Uh, for for the logistic regression, it's going to be your penalty and your mixture in logistic regression. And for decision trees, it's going to be cost complexity and the tree depth as we've explored. The final step to uh, to improving your models would be something called ensembling. So you can build your own ensemble models. And there's a package called, there's, there's three different types of ensembling. Boosting, so things like gradient boosting. Bagging. So we've seen an example of bagging. Uh, you can also use bag trees, etc. Um, and stacking. So you stack all your independent machine learning models and they then vote, create predictions the same way as we've seen with random forests. The stacks package is available there. Um, and if there's enough interest in the comments, I can either extend this example to use stacking further. I hope you've enjoyed that process. All the supporting code and the actual supported notebook is available on GitHub. Please subscribe and follow me soon for more tutorials. Thanks, guys.